Welcome back to Cosmic Brilliance, folks. I am so, so happy you are enjoying our copyrighted mini series with special guest, Dragon Fae super soldier, Apollomy Mendelian. Many of you have written in, thank you, to say you can't wait for part four. Woohoo! A quick reminder to try and watch or listen to the audio podcast to keep up with in order with this mini series so you're not lost because we don't have a lot of extra time to repeat much. But here's a super quick recap for first timers here. Apollomy originally came from Prime Source Creator's first universe, which works on the law of one and it's called Hanova. And she came to our free will experimental beta universe on earth. Her duties and abilities are multifold to say the least, and she must wear a holographic smart suit as long as she is on earth that has a projection of humans so that you don't see her dragon fey body. And for other reasons as well, we'll discuss in a future show. That being said, because of her abilities also to be fair and impartial, she works for the Starseed Council. She has all abilities, and even though she is considered young in dragon years, she has already done at least two 20s and back. Apollomy, like many of us, has had normal lives that Dolores Cannon calls digging potatoes. So just because we talk about her as being Bridget, a goddess, or Apollo, does not mean she hasn't also had plenty of normal lives, So, because that's always a question in people's heads. So welcome, Apollomy, and thank you so much for coming back to part four so we can continue this exciting adventure. Thank you so much for having me again. I'm really excited to be here to share not only past lives, but current life of meeting these deities. Cool. I'm, I'm excited too. So let's just get to it. We're also going to be covering two of your past lives. One is Apollo in ancient Greece and your presence in Atlantis. And you had a very important mission. First, I would like to start off with a bang regarding your mother's family lineage, because what I've learned from super soldiers is almost all of them come from a powerful lineage. Are you willing to share yours? Oh uh, yeah, I can do that. Okay, so what is your lineage? So I don't know too much about the full lineage. All I know is my, uh, my mother's side who actually ended up being my handler. And she is blood related to the queen of England by like, if she was to take over, or if I was to take over the throne, it would be like, like 130 people, maybe 120-ish. What does that mean, 120-ish? Which means that there's about 120 people in line for the throne through blood lineage if something was to happen before it would actually get to us. Get to you, <laughs> your family. Okay. Okay. Interesting. All right. Now, have you met the Queen Mother ever? In what I call my, I guess it would be like day life. No, but I have been taken by the ETs, especially the Dracos over there to be introduced to her. Uh, I've been to parties. You know, I've been, like the ball parties where like other people come over and, you know, she tried to do a lot to make me proper <laughs> and educated, but, you know, I just, I don't know, it's really weird. So, um, you know, as a young dragon elf, you mean she's trying to show you the ropes of how the proper, uh, shall we say, higher ups. Well, considering what species she really is like it was more of like trying to get me into the hierarchy and I just you know she was always like well since I own you you know I get to do what I want and I guess I could have taken that path but I didn't really understand what she really wanted from me you know because there was always that 
I'm always like looking ahead to see what's going on and it just felt kind of wrong in a place that I didn't really want to be. Good. Yeah. Fascinating. Is there anything else you want to share about that visit that stuck out with you? I mean, or anybody you met that was interesting? Well, there was a couple things like the the areas that we went to, like there was nice gardens and everything, but like some of the people who ended up coming to the meetings didn't overly look a lot of human. <laughs> you know, they're when you got blue skin and they're like, you know, green skin, it kind of is just a little off, you know. I mean, I could spot an ET a mile away in a human suit, but. But these would show up as natural because it was obviously special parties. For... If they looked human enough, yes. Mm. So humanoid versus mm -hmm. a spider walking in or an insect walking in or something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So now Apollo and me, I would like you to share your amazing memories that you have regained about Atlantis. What was involved there and what you did and take your time with the details, please. All right. Well, I, we kind of have to backtrack a little bit here. After the fall of Mars and Maldock, I ended up getting sentenced to Earth by the Starseed Council. And I spent my time in Lumeria quite a bit. Uh, I actually came down here uh, through my trajectory and my spaceship ended up crashing <laughs> in Lumeria and kind of killed a couple people. It was an accident. Apparently you, the people were there the were pilot? bad. You know, not every UFO is the best, even with good technology. Okay. Um, but I ended up killing some people and they ended up being bad people anyway. They actually worked for Dark Draco King Lucifer. So I, uh, I can't really consider that a loss. Or an accident. Or an accident. <laughs> okay. So that's how you landed. That's how I landed. Not landed. Okay. I actually spent a little time in Lemuria for a while. And then the Immortal Seven, who are avatars of Prime Source Creator from Hanova, ended up coming over here. And they wanted to start a experimental project. And they're the ones who made Atlantis. So back in the day, we didn't have this much ocean at all. You know, uh, the Bermuda Triangle, because of the way that it, it kind of was for the geological structure, that's where they, they made Atlantis. We have a crystal pyramid under there that is sentient and has a lot of data in it. And we used that to actually be one of the main power sources. Uh, it was in water. We actually kind of had to build land around the areas, which is the tr traditional rings that you see because they love sacred geometry. And the reason why they chose the Bermuda Triangle is because the crust is really thin there. So it allows the electromagnetic fields to come out stronger in that area. And if you know anything about crystals and electromag electromagnetivity, it actually helps activate that pyramid. And Atlantis had a lot of crystalline technology and a lot of crystallines for the buildings as well and our light structures and everything. So the experiment for Atlantis was to try and put the laws of one on this planet and to see how well it actually did. And the Immortal Seven technically ruled Atlantis for a good couple thousand years before they actually tried to send it on to, or should I say, bestow it onto a human royal family. Was this so, the royal family we were just talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Without mentioning names, okay. Right, and people have to understand that the energies were a lot different back then. People lived for a lot longer. It wasn't unknown for a human, you know, of the first or second generation of man to be living for thousands of years. Two, 3,000 years, you know, it's pretty, pretty good run. 
And that's, of course, also why you find those ages in uh, some of the uh, elders in the Bible, spoken in the Bible or different ancient texts, because they did live that long. And some were hybrids and everything else. Okay, so your mission was what? Why did you crash land in? <laughs> well, I was put down here for actual punishment to live amongst everyone. So I still had my powers and everything. I just wasn't allowed off world. You know, they're like, you, we're just going to put you here. And technically, like, if we really want to talk about technicality, uh, the Immortal Seven basically wanted me on the planet because they were making Atlantis and I didn't, I didn't know about it. Now the Starseed Council uh, works for the Immortal Seven. So instead of actually being tried the way that it usually would, they just moved my sentencing to different forms. And was this still quote punishment for you exploding Maldek mm -hmm. and, and the situation that happened in Hanova as a young dragon that you saw your two very best friends crossover got upset anger and some people got killed from the uh, power i did not know that me coming over here was actual punishment for the hanovian events i was completely uh, unaware of that i just got information that i had to come over here from my creator over there so uh, i do know like i went in before trial at the starsea council after the whole mars and Meldock incident and they were like, you know, you're going to get this much time on this much of a seed planet. So I ended up, they're like, the closest one is Earth. <laughs> so they're like, you're going to go over there for now. And yeah, at this time, like the planet Earth was already reformed, restructured by a lot of the galactical um people who ended up putting money into that so that planet this the planet that is earth now no longer belonged to the dracos so it was already established as a seed planet uh-huh okay the experiments were just completely different at the time okay and folks just a reminder um seed planets are always experiments done mm -hmm. and they have to go through three different periods before they're determined if they're a failure, then they're wiped so they don't become a virus uh, in the universe. Just a reminder. So Earth has been one of those and we're on the third and last uh, period of time and that uh, to ascend before the wipe. So, um, okay, now, so you came here and then what did you do here? I basically- Lattice. Right. I basically bummed around Lemuria for a while trying to get the feel of the place. And then once the Immortal Seven started to make Atlantis, they came and got me. And then we literally went over there. They started to create the structures, the housing, the rings, everything, just because they know how to manipulate the elements. It was very easy for them. We're talking like full scale magic here where you're just like, let there be land and they start gathering all the materials and everything something doesn't come from nothing so like there was still materials and stuff but they made the rings housing uh we had the docking stations for all the boats and everything especially on the outside of the rings like the citadel was the most important thing for the first atlantis Right. This is the very first one that ever existed before the sister cities. Mm. And the Citadel actually was a ship. It could go underwater or it could actually, uh, it's electromagnetic propulsion plus other stuff. So it could actually fly. And when we would use the Citadel to go to the sister cities, the main Citadel in in the sister cities that are would actually be the docking station for Atlantis, which is why you see the huge circle in the middle empty. That was our docking station. For the Citadel. Right. The, that was also a ship. Right. Submarine type ship. <laughs> and flying. And so flying. it could either go under the water or it could go 
so it was like circular. a UFO. It was circular. Yes. And Citadel being tall spire spires over that. Yeah. So it was circular at the bottom, and then it kind of was like this. I would almost say like a teardrop shape is the best description for it. And were most of the buildings at that time uh, made out of crystal? Yes, because that was one of our huge things. Like we didn't have electricity at the time like people do now. It was too primitive. Everything from cooking your food all the way to heating and cooling was all done by crystals. All we had to do was change the frequency of how the crystal vibrated for certain things. And it wasn't made out of just one type of crystal. These crystals were basically, some of them were forged in outer space and then came down here, you know, because the whole gravity thing, you get a lot pure crystals out in space than you, than you do already in electromagnetic field of such a big planet. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know the really advanced spacecraft also uses uh, crystal power and technology. Right. And there's also something about Atlantis being known for the red crystals, mining, uh, using red crystals. Did you know anything about that? We didn't really have a lot of red crystals when okay. I was there. They were clear or blue or green. Oh, higher vibration colors. Yes. Okay, now just a little sideways. Uh, I haven't talked to anyone who remembers being in Lemuria. So uh, when you were exploring that, what was that like? What did that look like? It was still pretty primitive. They had some technology. They definitely started to have a little bit of the sacred geometry stuff going over there. Um, it wasn't very, what's the word I'm looking for? It was kind of like they were kind of just starting off a little bit, <laughs> you know? So I it wasn't mean, very sophisticated. Their social structure was very decent. It's not like they were sticks and stones or anything. They had an established society. Uh, they were definitely a lot more calmer than people are today in the world, you know. So there was some trife and tribulations in quite a few areas, and it seemed like they were experiencing new things. I'm not quite sure who set them down here for for the experiment, but they haven't they hadn't been there for overly that long beforehand. Mm -hmm. And did they welcome you? Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, because that's uh, the Hawaiian Islands are left over from that area. I understand from Lemuria. Okay, so back to Atlantis. So how? Uh, of course, time's kind of made up, but how long were you there? What happened? Uh, and we have something called three three or maybe four eras of Atlantis. And you came in pre at the very beginning, which you're describing, but you also had to do uh, something at the very end. So uh, any other details that you can share? So it's pretty much matches the pictures we see of circles. Mm -hmm. right. and you're going to see those all over the world. The, the biggest ones are going to be in the Bermuda Triangle. There's one in South, uh, South America. There's one in the, there should have been one in the Egyptian areas, but you got to remember it was a long time ago. I don't think they found it yet. And then there's also another one in the Yucatan. Okay. And the ones you're talking Citadel slash uh, ship slash arcs are what are you talking about there wouldn't really be too much of an arc but it's kind of like it has the ability to create life around it the harmonics coming off of this gave a lot of life a lot of prana which is like source energy uh, around it um, the citadel in Atlantis itself had the tablets of the laws of one, which the immortal seven ended up teaching humanity. Mind you, this is a humanity that had all species and types. Earth travel off and on for UFOs and everything was absolutely legal. There was, wasn't really any like it wasn't like it was now. Not everyone looked the same. There was so many species that came over here. It was a huge trading port. 
So they, they tried to teach the laws of one to everyone and they welcomed everybody as long as they were truthful. Like there was certain morals that you had to have of yourself in order to actually be a citizen of Atlantis, which was you had to be truthful. You had to be neutral, which was you couldn't just go up and be a jerk to somebody. You would literally like pretty much get killed. <laughs> So a lot of the, the laws of Hanova ended up transferring over to just the, if you wanted to be a member of Atlantis, those and the sister cities and all of the little docks and stuff, because they did have a really big uh, Navy. And the Navy was actually more for protection from being outside of Atlantis because not the whole world was not peaceful. You had a lot of people who were basically mercenaries or bandits. We still had the Luc uh, Dark Draco King Lucifer's people to occasionally deal with. So all of the smaller rings that people see all over the world, those were our trading ports. People did live there. They, they had housing and stuff there sometimes, but uh, they weren't as big as the sister cities. And doing what we're doing today, but most people don't know, is we're trading nonstop through the galaxies with minerals mm -hmm. and food and supplies. So it started off as kind of the first major experiment, well, Murray and that, and a couple older ones, Hyperborea. Um, but it started off as the first experiment of a seed planet, which that allowed multiple extraterrestrial species to also come, like kind of open territory right? We had air open territory for everything all the way up until the fifth era of man. And then they shut everything off. Uh huh. Okay. Which we're in now the fifth year. Okay. All right. So, um, but there was no rules like there was here that no. ETs can come in because they're coming into a human body uh, so that they're kind of disguised. <laughs> no, there, there was no, there was no veil hindering any prana like cap there was no matrix, you know, they, they had one of the matrixes up obviously for the Starseed Council to monitor Ascension and for it being a, you know, experimental planet, right. but right. So, but other than that, like there wasn't any, like they didn't have to wear matrix suits to come down here. If you were ET and you came down here, you could be yourself. Yeah. That's, that's kind of my vague memory of that time too. It was so great. I mean, you had everyone there, demigods, gods, this, that, ETs, everything. Right. Okay. And uh, I'd like you to remind, or we need to remind people that the, if I have this right, that the objective of every seed planet, which is always an experimental planet with working on some particular experiment created by a certain group of creators, uh, the objective of all that and and maybe everything in the universe is the ascension is that true the objective of the ascension is not usually in the same objective line for creating a seed planet the star seed council who is made by prime creator source nova has specific laws that every seed planet has to follow per planetary creator for the seed planets they also have to follow that too so that's this their own agenda from source the agenda from the seed planet council of creators has their own agendas of or what kind of evolution are they looking for who are they going to put down here what's the the full outcome of this they have usually a assigned goal that they work together with, and then they have their own little side goals of their own to deal with too. Because every creator who puts profit into that seed planet, they get to seed that planet with whatever species and stuff like that that they can do. If they want their specific humanoids or whatever of humanity to be acting one way, there, it could be completely different from the other creators teaching theirs to act another way. But it's not necessarily then to go through a whole ascension growing up process and ascend. The ascension is safety protocols so that um, experiments do not break the balance of 
you know, becoming a virus, becoming too destructive and destroying everything. Because if the planet gets too destructive and becomes a virus, it has to be wiped out. Same with the universes. If a universe gets too destructive and starts just taking and taking and breaking the fabric of reality, it will also get wiped out. And that's from the Arbor Council. Okay. And uh, are you allowed to share publicly your job in the wipeout? Yeah, I, I work for the Star Seed Council, as I've mentioned before. My job is to evaluate and assess seed planets to see if they are passing or failing further right, ascension. But I, I mean the one who actually does the wiping. Yeah, that's also part of my job. I also end up doing the wiping. I have wiped this planet too many times. Yes, which is very, very hard to do. It's but. not it's not an easy job at all. Like you have to go through a lot of training. They the Sea Council makes sure that you have the mentality for it of being unbiased, no matter what happens to you on the planet, to be able to continue your job. And it's one of the hardest jobs I ever have to have because, you know, normally our team would get dropped down for four years before a wipe. But because of the karmic debt that I have to carry over from Meldoc, I ended up staying here. So I've been reincarnated on one other seed planet too, which is across from our sun. But uh, most people know that as second earth, it has two moons. Um, but, you know, it, you try not to get attached to people, you know, you but you still have to value and see the quality of life you know i i've gone through a lot of planets for my job and it's never easy to commit mass genocide ever because it's not just people it's animals plants everything we're talking full global scale because you have to do this job one is you are have a very rare ability to be able to do it i would imagine and the second is it's it's like if you attach or start over loving people here and even though you realize that it's just usually a shard or a, or uh you know a, a fractal of their over self uh for the betterment of the whole if it's becoming too negative or too vo too much of a virus you ha you are the one that has to wipe them out is that correct yes that is correct Oh, wow. If we get too attached to anything and can't do our job, there are others who work for the seed council that do the same thing on other seed planets. I'm not the only one. There's hundreds of us, you know, the other, the other group that we come down with, they give the warning signs. So I'm basically like, my job is the, the final final protocol and then they usually have like a thousand years after that before we do the true wipe right we talked about all those rules in part two so people can refer to that it's just an intense job i really feel for you it's like oh. i've only had to be pulled from two planets that i remember because i couldn't actually do my job i got too attached to things well, how often are, here's an interesting question. How often are seed experimental planets successful? What's the percentage? Do we even know? It, it really just depends. Out of all of the seed planets that I have had to be doing since I got onto the council, uh, it's kind of about a 50-50 in this universe. <laughs> okay. So it, it really just depends. Well, thank you for for trusting us and sharing that uh, information because that's very close to your heart. And let's get back into the main subject of Atlantis. So that was your experience there. So in the first part establishing, is there anything, any event, anything that you wish to share before you go toward to the end part of Atlantis? Well, like I said, Atlantis had a lot of different species in it. The, towards the end, of what I remember of being Atlantis, we started allowing um, 
humans to be able to take the mantle because the immortal seven were really like okay i think they're ready now they've gotten everything down let's see how they do under human rule of keeping the laws of one and so a royal family basically was established and everything was going really good you know the immortal seven still stayed there they actually stayed in the citadel again the citadel was very high technology had a lot of technology knowledge um, ability and crafting uses as well but not a lot of people were actually allowed in the citadel you either had to be a member of the royal family or a priest or priestess of the laws of one to get in there you had to take a huge vow of oath there was a lot to go in there because there was a lot of technology that did not need to be out that the civilization of this universe let alone world needed it needed to be very safe kept guarded and there was a lot of uh protocols too so um like life in atlantis was pretty pretty peaceful you know they had uh high technology for surgeries this did not replace doctors you know, they, you still had to like have your bones adjusted and then we would like run the technology over you. They're basically high versions of med beds. Med beds, but, I was gonna say, light frequencies, color, sound. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. When you were in Atlantis, you had full med bed technology to the, to the prime core. And I say med bed technology because we still use devices and stuff, but we also taught people to heal with the, with frequency. So the tonal languages, everything was to that of sacred geometry. And you could use your voice to actually heal someone. No one got sick in Atlantis because of our crystal technology. It was always vibrating to heal you while you were there. That's why you had to be a citizen in order to like really get into certain parts of Atlantis. The, out, the two outer rings were for visitors. You had your marketplaces, your housing districts, you know, for, for visitors and stuff, but you could not get into the, the better parts of Atlantis unless you were a citizen. And that is with a bracelet that usually, like you could have a bracelet, you could have our traditional hand uh, bracelets that go from here to here and it has a gem right here. There was always some form of crystal on you that was bound to your soul signature and literally would let you in and work the higher technologies. No visitor got that. How clever. So it was done with jewelry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The jewelry. Yeah. And, and the jewelry could be uh, any color that you wanted. Like they would specifically make that for you. And obviously it's for protection. And yes. Sure that the wrong, since there's so many pirates and different people and traders and multiple agendas and stuff going on all the time that they couldn't access those key sacred places. Correct. Yeah. That makes sense. And a lot of the Atlantean houses were actually in the, the like barrier pretty much like nothing would work. Like you would, you would go over to one of the walls and you could actually not get in unless well, you actually had one of those crystals. That sounds like the arcs which we'll talk about in another show, but you can't get in without the right frequencies or genetic, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, like to cook your food and stuff, we had like crystalline, um, kind of like, it, it kind of looks like a normal burner that you have now, you know, like on a gas stove, mm -hmm. but you would literally set it on electromagnetic generator and it would literally heat the crystal up. And then you could actually use your, your terracotta pots or pans or, you know, your vases, stuff like that. Because the, the specific terracotta would actually activate with the, um, the frequencies that were being generated. So it would actually kind of just vibrate, healthfully vibrations, you know, yes. your water and stuff. And you could use your vocals to sing to it too, because you can control the, we taught them how to control the elements with their voices. Yes, I look forward to those classes being taught. All right. <laughs> I have a long teaching when it when it comes to me, because like I whew. 
<laughs> in your academy, but those are the kind of things, you know, I want people to learn. Uh, hopefully I'll have a show in the future where we can teach how people can heal using the principles of the med beds with their own consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's one of my goals. I think that would be interesting. Do you have a lot of memory of all the uh, high tech? I mean, of all the tech and all the ways to use it and all of that? Some of it, like our boats are the boats, the sailboats, you know, we had a little like wave schooners and stuff. They had electromagnetics to them. Uh, some of the crystal technology obviously was what powered it. So our, our ships, like even, even for like the single sail, like schooner ships, they had shielding. We also had weaponry. Our weaponry looked very primitive. You could have crystal scepters, crystal swords, crystal shields, very lightweight. But because we learned and taught the humanity how to harness their own power, you would actually have laser weapons because you would be you know, using your own uh, focus and energy to be emitting the beam that comes from that. Mm -hmm. your own intention and consciousness you know it's a lot more than that but yeah <laughs> fascinating okay um so that that describes a lot about the culture and music and dance and entertainment and a lot of beautiful nature yeah they kind of like to party a little bit i'm not gonna lie there was a lot of good food and we had trade from all over the world and all over the solar system so we had a plethora of different kinds of foods you know, we also, I, as I said before, we also have mermaids who live there as well. So we actually had underwater um, areas and cities for them under there. It's just so beautiful. Right. And they actually helped maintain the uh, crystal pyramid in the Bermuda Triangle. Oh, lovely. Lovely. I've always appreciated their kind. Yes. Beautiful. Uh, anything else you'd like to share on that? I guess it depends on what you want us to go over. Like we definitely had a lot of schools of different types between forging, uh, energy use, healing, poetry, like the arts were very important to uh, the Atlanteans, you know, um, just abiding by the the laws of one we, we i wouldn't say we had preachers or anything like that but going to the sister cities our, our priests and priestesses would would live in those areas and make sure everything was running smoothly and helping those royal families with with that as well i know most people are like ooh, royal families but you got to understand that the cultures back then were completely different it it's not like you know, they were ruled to treat everyone fairly. Everyone had a house. Everyone had their needs met. If you worked, you, you got free health care, everything. They provided for you. Yes, that's how it should be. Right? Yes, definitely. Um, okay, now then what happened as the drama enters? <laughs> when the... Okay, so I can't really give an overly time frame, but Dark Draco King Lucifer ended up messing up Mars for their ascension. We had to do a quick judgment right then and there because it just crashed so quickly for for their ascension. Um, Hold on a sec. Their ascension meaning Dark Draco are the beings living on Mars at the time. Uh, Mars was a seed planet and Dark Draco King Lucifer ended up infiltrating it and just they were doing fantastic and great and with just in like a year a couple of years they literally crashed and we had to do a super wipe like really all of a sudden so like we got everyone off as much as we could who actually passed the ascension at that point um but we had a wipe and basically orbit nuke everything else so yeah. uh dark draco king lucifer who is a red draconian who is the king of the draconian empire in the draco system ended up coming to earth and was already trying to do the same thing i think around the same time but it took him a lot longer to deal with with earth well 
the royal family at the time had two sons and a daughter and the eldest son who was going to be king uh, ended up siding with Draco King Lucifer. The Immortal Seven kind of saw this going on, but at this point they were playing neutral. They had agreed that they would not interfere with whatever happened. Mm-hmm. They were not going to interfere with whatever happened since the time they gave up, basic, not power, but like gave up their, their spot of the mantle. And they got to the point where, you know, it was literally... it was so hard to tell when the seasons were because we didn't have snow the polar ice caps and and the sol- like southern ice caps did not exist at the time there was civilizations in antarctica and everything um so i couldn't really tell you what season it was it was like summer almost all year <laughs> it was really nice and during that time you know we were getting ready for basically a celebration and the there was kind of a strifle between the royal family of when the prince wanted to be king because he was starting to get pushy starting to be like you know you should retire i should be stepping in by now and we didn't i didn't know it at the time because i was just you know kind of like a, a champion it took the immortal seven a while to kind of tell me what was going on and it took even more so to step off to the side and not do anything. You were going to say something? Yeah. First, you said the prince, prince of who, who which prince? Uh, the prince of Atlantis. Okay. Who was not draconian? Though? No, they, he, they were human. Okay. All right. Of the royal family there. Right. Okay. All right. And keep going. Um, when I got to Atlantis, I basically got championed as, uh, light's champion. Light is one of the immortal seven. And so she ended up, well, she, sorry. (laughs) I always keep thinking like light is a female, but you never actually get to see what kind of gender they are. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, cause they always wear robes. Like they're always, when you see them, they're like, you see this much of them and then robes and that's it. Like you never get to, to see. So. Now this is on Hanova we're talking. And they well, say. Also, also in Atlantis. So the immortal seven came here. Yes. Physically. For Atlantis also. Yes. Wow. They, they actually were on earth. They actually did all of the teachings themselves to humanity. They're the ones who made Atlantis. Oh my goodness. So do they, do they project into an avatar? They, I guess like they ended up uh, being physical. You couldn't hurt them. Like they literally showed all the time. Like they would like sit there and like, they took their own swords and stuff and smash it against their arms and it couldn't hurt them. Yes. Oh, so they were here themselves. That's huge. Yeah. That's a huge deal. And folks, you're going to have to listen to uh, part two to learn all about the immortals. But um, there are se- seven or actually nine because uh, two are twins. And they are the one first fragmentation off from source reality, <laughs> our prime source. So you're talking really powerful creators. Right. And- and each one is in charge of an element or a capacity. So when she talks about light, that is one of the immortal sevens, right? Yes. Okay. And I got championed as, or sorry, I got, I guess you could call it knighted. I got knighted as a champion of the immortal seven of light. And when that happens, they actually bestow some of their power to you so that I ended up getting bestowed as a protector not just of Atlantis, but also of the laws of one. Okay, fascinating. Now, what did you have to do to earn that? I I have no idea. (laughs) They were just like, (laughs) they're just like, we're, we're bestowing this to you. And I'm like, are you sure about this? Like, do you not like, I know, you know what I just did over at Beldock. Like that was a complete accident. 
yes you no know, they're like we forgive you for that but you still have to pay your chromatic debt and i'm like okay light's main focus is justice and truth okay that's and- key So the only thing that I could think of is literally because I was truthful about, you know, I served justice upon myself because I didn't run from blowing up Maldoc. I literally took the blunt of it, even though it wasn't my fault exactly. Some things just, you know, happened and I, but it was my weapon. So I took responsibility for that, you know. And they were impressed by that. I guess. Yeah. Okay, so a champion means you're a protector of the seed experiment, a particular no. immortal. What, are, what? No, I, I was literally just a protector of Atlantis. So I protect their civilians and protect the citadel. And you were as a Ptolemy now, like what was your form? What did you? Were you I more- had my same body as I did when I came from Hanova. So dragon elven, mm-hmm. uh huh, celestial dragon elven. So of course you have all your magical abilities and everything else. Yeah. Oh. So cool. That's a pretty important job there. How many champions were there? Each life? immortal seven uh, gave one person a champion. Mm-hmm. Champion. This. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> what kind of word would I put that there? I guess knighted. Yeah knighted one person to come forth and so all seven were uh were on atlantis with you or the other six were on atlantis with you from the immortals uh there there was only four of them that stayed at all times and the other ones just kind of came to visit every once in a while and what are those elements or light uh water trying to So what people would consider source silver, source gold, light, and earth. Okay, interesting. Well, matter, technically. Okay. All right. And you talked previously a little bit about the golden and silver spiral. So Mm -hmm. teach that in your academy. Okay, but we, we need to stay on track with the Atlantean thing. Okay, so... That's an amazing job you had. Okay, so now what? What happened towards the end of Atlantis? The prince that was supposed to be crowned king, who got impatient, ended up siding with Dark Draco King Lucifer. And it was from there that he started to taint a lot of the other people of Atlantis. You know, some of the new ones who had just come in and weren't fully set in their ways yet, you know, like things, things happen. Um, And unfortunately, it was only like 15% of Atlantis, but that was enough to, to literally kind of dive bomb everything. The day that we got attacked, it was towards nighttime and we managed to because the immortal seven know everything they managed to get everybody out of atlantis like we were we saw the huge motherships of the dracos coming for us because apparently they had been attacking you know they had set up a full-scale attack around a lot of uh, the atlantis outposts and the sister cities and as far as i know we were the first ones to be attacked okay so the immortal seven pretty much had everyone get everyone else out they were literally going through portals and uh, some of them were going on ships and we i ended up having to go to the citadel and helping the immortal seven get all of the artifacts out of there all of them the citadel could still be used but it would not have the knowledge or technology that it currently had I don't know what exactly they did with the artifacts. I mean, I know some of them have been found because I'm linked to them. So currently in the last couple of years, some of the artifacts had been found for whatever the Immortal Seven hid them. And I started remote viewing what was going on. <laughs> so that was that was interesting. Um, and then it was my job to actually take care of the draconians and just hold them off to to try and make sure everyone got out 
I got ordered. That? Yeah. They didn't have an army or anything like that of their own? Or? No, the armies actually ended up evacuating. So you're left there by yourself to fight the entire draconian? Yeah, we had some draconians on the out, outer rings because they couldn't get inside. Um, you know, because you have to, even if you were to give your amulet or your, your stuff to other people, some draconians, the true draconians, the alpha draconians, they can shapeshift. But because it is such a pure part of your oversoul, you could not get into Atlantis. They, they, do, they just couldn't. And so I had to fight my way through them, you know, go to that outer areas. But the Immortal Seven literally told me to basically self-destruct the inner rings of Atlantis, the housing district and everything else. I couldn't destroy the Citadel. That's beyond my abilities. So all of the housing and everything just basically disintegrated into sand. And the outer rings were still there because that's, it was just marketplaces and stuff like that. They didn't really care. Um, you know, cause not, not a lot of the high, high technology ever left the barrier. And that's what the, all the thing is always protecting the ancient sacred rights and, mm -hmm. uh, and well, a lot of our, a lot of our medical equipment, um, our forging areas, everything like that, like that was all behind the barrier. All of the trade stuff that was allowed to be traded from Atlantis was on the outer rings. And the healing, and healing things and med, the medical bed type. That was all behind the safety okay, of the so barrier. Everything was protected. Yeah. Wow. And I ended up, I could fly at the time and I ended up flying and I was like literally standing flying with like these ships, these huge, huge motherships. And I ended up taking down a few of them before I ended up getting defeated. So you died. Fortunately, I didn't get, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't get Dark Draco King Lucifer, but. Oh, you didn't get him, which was your target. You want to. Yeah, he was my, he was my target. Uh-huh. So you died in that, that lifetime. Yeah. As the, okay. Celestial elven being called Apollony. Right. Wow. Amazing. People, um, this is just a synopsis that I gathered from books and uh, Elka's book on Atlantis that she compiled from uh, many sources. So this is just a really brief historical update just for all those listening of the first year of Atlantis, the second year of Atlantis, and the third year of Atlantis. So I'll read this really quick.
Now, what do you have to say about that? Well, the what they say is the first era of Atlantis uh unfortunately makes sense because the prince who ended up letting the dark draco king lucifer in was still alive i ended up connecting with one of the uh, reincarnated princesses of atlantis and she still had a lot of memories she knew what happened after i died because you know i was dead and i didn't get any information and she told me that her brother ended up taking Atlantis and the Draco ended up taking over as well. They they end up sharing it. So even though the Citadel could still work, and I don't know how they managed to get around it. I don't know if the Immortal Seven ended up just taking down the the protocols and everything else and just let them have basically the ship, but it didn't have the tablets in it, it didn't have a lot of the high technology that the Immortal Seven put in there. So now they just, I mean, don't get me wrong, Atlantis is still formidable and can still provide for everything, but it's not as powerful as it used to be without those artifacts. So when you say Atlantis is still formidable, it still exists. Yes. And tell people a little bit about that. Well, the last time I ended up searching out Atlantis, because I'm still kind of connected with it, uh, I've done this several times throughout years. And it, last time I felt it, it was towards Antarctica, you know, off of the coast quite a bit between Antarctica and Asia. I've also felt it, you know, near Ireland, like it has the ability to move around. It has a cloaking device. It's, it can be a submarine or it can be, well, I mean, it's technically a UFO. It just can't go into space. So, so that's important to know too, because, uh, and then get into a future show on arcs and all of that. Too. Right. And then when I came from the, when I was in another timeline where Atlantis actually rose up again, there was blonde people in there. Like they they came out, you know, some of them had like really white hair and some of them had like a little bit of blonde. And I'm like, who the heck are these guys? Like, did they evolve? Cause they have not maybe seen sunlight. I don't know, but <laughs> the ones that I left with, you know, for the Royal family, they had like olive skin and darker, darker brown hair. So. Interesting. Well, the inner earth also has a, a large group of blondes and everything every group but that's interesting thank you so much for sharing all that fascinating information about atlantis and how you ended up being the champion and having to fight the whole draconians all on your own i mean that's like so amazing it's like a marvel movie right <laughs> but anyway i want to continue on so that you can share a little bit about a past which our audience knows is simultaneous at the same time life as Apollo in Greece. So uh, I believe he was known as a demigod, wasn't he, in ancient Greece? Uh, as far as I know, he was one of the the normal gods. Okay. Okay. So um, go ahead and share whatever you'd like to share. Well, I'm just starting to get some of my memories back from him, like. I, I know that my sister was Artemis um, and that I was really good with a bow. I actually am so pretty good with a bow now, naturally. It's really weird. <laughs> so, I, and I thought that my bow skills were from me being trained by Artemis in this life for astral traveling when I was younger. But at the time, like, I didn't quite understand that I had been Apollo either and that Apollo is still alive uh, it's like a after I died in Atlantis I don't know how many years it had been but sitting at the bottom of the ocean uh, you get kind of bored so I ended up fracturing myself into two uh, deities and one of them is Apollo and the other one is a uh, bridge which we'll talk about she's a Celtic deity yes mm -hmm. okay and uh, so what happened now you were you just happened to slip these things in which are so awesome like while I was like sitting at the bottom of the ocean and it was boring <laughs> because a as a being you can do anything you can be anywhere do anything right 
well I wouldn't say anything but it uh, there's a lot more freedom <laughs> yes yes so you were just contemplating what you wanted to do next well either I could cease to exist or you know um I could stay there for a while and see if anyone was gonna pick me up have never any, happened did you have any mermaid girlfriends Would mermaid you- girlfriends <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I'm not specious. We'll put it that way. As long as they're, as long as they're, they can at least speak some sort of tonal language and not a full animal. I'm good. Okay. All right. Considering you were underwater, I thought, Hey, take advantage of it. Right. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So you tell us about your lifetime as Apollo in ancient Greece, anything, I know you're getting your memories back, but anything you can share about that at all. So you were saying that you, you remember your twin sister Artemis, and she's taught you, uh, you remember her teaching you archery, and your, your skills as an archer were automatic, like, it it took me a little while to like, super hone in but I can still do the trick shot that she had taught me which is uh where my arrow goes like this and then bends down and then shoots up I it's a very interesting technique and I've always been able to do it in this lifetime and it just kind of defies physics I have two people who've done archery their whole life. And when I told them about it, they're like, no, you're lying. You're jesting. He's like, I've been doing archery since I was 12 and I've never and been to tournaments and never seen anything do that. And I showed him and both of the guys' jaws just dropped to the floor. They're like, what the heck? I've done it with fletching, without fletching. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's a compound bow, a, a recurve, Mongolian short bow. Well, with powers and magical abilities and your full on self, you can, uh, how, how shall we say, override the laws of physics as taught in this primitive world. Yeah. <laughs> <it's that way. laughs> so, right. Like, or that it's been hidden from people actually in this world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember being Apollo, like my body was really good. I'd be like, mm, why can't I find a boyfriend <laughs> like that? But, you know, <laughs> not to sound narcissist or anything, but. You know, tall, the hair was actually more of gold than blonde. I know they predict, protect him as like a blonde haired for the sun, but it was actually gold for pretty much. And, uh, I had blue eyes. And he was known connected to light also. Yes. Talk about that. Well, I don't really remember exactly how he ended up doing that, but there was always like this glow about him. Like light would just kind of shine off of him. Like he was, everyone emits light. Okay. It's, it's part of your bioelectric field, but this was like a, a like soothing white light that always kind of came off of him. And it which was just is kind part of-, of your celestial ability, but there's a common theme here, which is light right because yeah. because as apollo me and atlantis were the champion of one of the immortals with the quality of light and as apollo he's often known as the uh, multiple things we'll share in a minute like you know light the sun all of those things right and so you're carrying that theme and those abilities through i think i just my sister uh... My sister always made the joke of me being a torch at night because every single time we like tried to sneak around during the forest and everything, like I would just be kind of like bright, you know, it took me a while to learn how to hone it down a bit, but she would always joke at me. Wow. And uh, this is your sister in this family here? No, uh, uh, Artemis. Oh, this is Artemis. Okay. Oh, she says you're not doing a good job at camouflaging. No, not really. (laughs) And you really suck at hide and seek at night. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about hide and seek. It's bad. Okay. All right. And what else, hon? Anything else you can remember in Greece at that time? Well, I remember her and I like doing a lot of archery stuff together. We would always try to outdo each other. 
I remember literally like the harp that I used to use. The harp was gold and it had gold strings, silver strings, and brass strings. Well, technically they're copper, but you know, and each one was literally to harmonics that were the music back then was way different. It, it doesn't even sound the same now. You, we mentioned that a little bit in part one or two, and was that a, was that your harp or did it belong to your mother? The golden harp with the crystal uh, strings, that was my mother's harp in Hanova. Okay, and this one is a lyre, uh, a lyre too, or a harp? No, her harp was huge. Your like, harp. Okay. her harp was really big. The one that I ended up getting as Apollo would technically be like this actually i just happen to have it right here <laughs> oh my goodness so it had more strings than this uh-huh but it was oh, about, it's beautiful okay it's about the same Oops, sorry oh beautiful okay this sounds terrible to me because it's not toned to the strafigo frequencies and nylon strings sound ter terrible. Absolutely oh, terrible. Oh, solfeggio frequencies. Yeah, that yes. was. Yeah, because they, you don't, they're not crystal. They're not crystalline and tuned, yes. You can still have solfeggio strings made out of metal. <laughs> yes, yeah, you can. And, you can, that's true. Do you play it well? I, let's just say I just kind of picked it up and I have not attuned myself to it yet. Okay, but that's probably a bleed through from your lifetime before, maybe too. I've always loved harps ever since I was a little girl, like in this lifetime, like I've always been drawn to them, but you don't get taught them in grade school for band class and you don't get taught them in high school either. So you kind of have to wait to go to college for that sort of thing. And music classes are really expensive. Yeah, well, it's very high vibrational. Harps are, yeah, resonant. Yeah. And I, I'm actually more prone to wind instruments, except for the harp for string instrument instruments, and the mandolin for um, Chinese. Mm, it's a beautiful one too. Yeah. Are you able to play instruments automatically for the most part? Playing them has definitely evolved over the years. Uh, I have a hard time playing them when they're not in tune. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's my, like my ears. However, my band teacher in this lifetime noticed that I have a ear for pitches and tones. So I will know when something is completely off key. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. And do you remember fighting as Apollo or doing anything? Uh, fighting, no, not so much. Um, I, most of my memories are literally like being in the forest with my sister when we were adults and, you know, I had some love interests off to the side, but, you know, it, it's, it's more of that, uh, sitting in the forest uh, near a waterfall with my, with my harp and literally making music you know, teaching people. I did actually get some past life memories of being a human, you know, while I was Apollo. I, I was human and working uh, laborish jobs. Oh, interesting. So you projected yourself into a human body or you... I'm not entirely quite sure on that one. That's interesting. So you kind of just hung out and had a good time as Apollo and taught people also? Yeah. Okay, that's kind of fun. You'll probably get more and more memories as, as we go along. Well, right. and, go ahead. And when I was a little girl, like I was going through the projects and stuff, you know, like they, they really kind of make you dive into yourself. And I noticed that my solar plex chakra the most when I started diving into it, I ended up seeing Apollo. Whoa. So I was like, I was like six, six years old ish. 
like maybe seven at most. And, you know, I knew who he was instantly. You know, I was like, oh my God, you're Apollo, you know? And he's like, I'm you. <laughs> and I didn't really take it to heart or anything back then, you know? But Very it was like, it was, it was really interesting. And then of course, like later on, I started getting memories. Well, that was a very powerful. He's always very romantic. That I remember that the most. <laughs> that Apollo was romantic. Very romantic. Like loves to like you know be all like intimate and just he's like he's like my male side. Yeah. You know where it's just like, but it's kind of weird because like he likes to woo people. He's he's very yeah. romantic. He likes to write poetry and music oh, and yes, <laughs> give flowers and all those other stuff. Which create creates him as a balanced male though too. You go mm -hmm. both 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 ways. That's interesting. Well, it was really interesting because like the memories I have from being bridged, uh, is kind of the opposite. She's like. She's a female, but she has more of like my male aspect. She's more like she has that creative side, but she was also very like logical too. Yes. It's interesting how you can play with that in, in different bodies. Okay, well, thank you. So let's move ahead now to hanging out with the deities and gods. So <laughs> that's what I call it. So in ancient times, folks, deities were seen not so much as creator gods alone, but also mentors, as Apollomy mentioned. And I consider the ones that want to be worshipped a lot and get jealous by others as the god beings that you could say are playing around with a little bit of the more darker self-serving polarity and the ones that wish to empower others and humans are, you could say, would be on a little bit of the lighter service to others polarity. And many deities, just like many super soldiers, have played both sides. So as humans, as I believe, as we remember ourselves as God beings, uh, we will transform the practice of worshiping these beings, which I'm not into at all, uh, often giving power away to an approach of respectful equanimity while maintaining our non-victim sovereignty mm -hmm. and seeing them as a polymy says as mentors and they are definitely as you will learn are not perfect nope. <laughs> right <laughs> no nope, not at all <laughs> okay so um let's have you you have just fairly recently recalled being uh i think it's pronounced bree breach uh bridget, bridget. sometimes called saint bridget and and celtic and she is referred to as a goddess. And what was so fascinating to me is that when I first talked to you, I got a huge hit that you had Tuatha de Danon genetic somewhere. Now, for those of you, you that know about the Tuatha de Danon, it, it literally means the people of Dana and they tend to be elven. And so um, there's not a lot of information about them. And so I brought this up with Apollomy and Apollomy goes, oh my gosh, yeah, sure enough, because I've met the goddess Dana. <laughs> and um, just, I wanna fill you in a little bit about who Breach is and then she'll, she'll share memories. So I looked it up and Breach means exalted one and ready for this folks, Breach ends up being the daughter of Dagta, which is the good earth god, who is the king of the Tuatha de Danon, which for those of you who don't know, is a tribe of mystical gods with magical abilities closely connected to the elves. So Breach is known in history as the Celtic goddess of spring, a sage, a goddess of healing, poetry, arts and crafts, the forge, and the alchemical force of firepower. I'm detecting a theme here in your lifetimes. If firepower isn't you, I don't know what is. So get this folks, Breach was also reportedly born with flames around her head on February 1st, now celebrated as Imbold, the beginning of spring. She is a powerful being and through her fires and light, she is the patroness of healing arts, fertility, 
poetry, music, prophecy, agriculture, and smithcraft. Many people also call her the goddess of the well, as she has also ties to the element of water. She loves learning, knowledge, and inspiration, and set up a school in County Kildare, Ireland, in the middle of a sacred grove. Her followers would come to her for 30 years of learning. The first 10 years, she taught them healing herbs, tending livestock, and forging tools with iron. The second 10 years, she taught them to tend the sacred grove of oak trees and other trees. And the final 10 years was spent in teaching. Along with the sacred grove, oak grove, there was a sacred flame and a healing water well that is still there to this day. And supposedly that's where the custom of throwing coins into a well for good luck began. And how did you respond to that when I was sharing that info with you? So ever since I was a little girl, I always liked throwing coins into water sources. I mean, no one taught me this. Like I literally would just go over and do it. And <laughs> it was so bad. Like sometimes I would just do it to puddles. Like if it rained outside, <laughs> I would literally throw it in there. So there you go. That's kind of interesting bleed through. She was invoked by men when they went into battle, by midwives for good luck and birthing, and by all for healing. Solar crosses with four equal arms were woven on in bulk to honor Breach's role in bringing forth the four seasons, starting with spring. So you will see her depicted here with her flaming red hair, green and blue eyes. And when I said, oh, I'm showing her both with green and blue eyes, what did you say? Uh, I have... Well, I, when someone says that they have green or blue eyes, that usually hints to tetrachromia. And I was actually born with tetrachromia. I actually have blue and green. It goes uh, one ring around and one ring towards my pupils. So fascinating. Is that connected to the elven or dragon species usually? Do we know? Well, my dragon species has crystal blue eyes and I'm not quite sure where the green comes from. <laughs> oh. Like I know some elven species have green eyes, like the, the Twatha Danan. So what you're seeing here, folks, is the picture. And one, one uh, picture is showing her as a triple goddess, representing her fires of the hearth, inspiration, and the forge. So the major thing and a very common theme is not only is she multi-talented, but she always has fire and light. She's the patroness of healing arts, fertility, poetry, music, prophecy, agriculture, and smithcraft. So uh, we, I personally do know that in the journey of souls that we do as a soul journeys uh, through its evolution, it's all, it often spends a, thousands, hundreds, millions of years to master different elements, be it water, earth, fire, or air. So, Apollomy, do you feel you've mastered all those elements? When I'm in my actual dragon body, yes. I, I have been told that, you know, a lot of things come easier to me than most, and that it also might be a reason why I'm S-class versus uh, just a lower class for Section 13. Aha, uh -huh. you bet you, I'm sure. S-class is the highest class. Uh, as the section 13's ranking system is based upon how much damage you can do by yourself. <laughs> so it either sounds for superpower or a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could put it that way. Okay. Um, but I was also told that a lot of people only have like maybe one or two abilities when, you know, I have quite a bit. Which That's I thought I, was normal. No, I was told that um, many people going to their, uh, uh, if we look at it linearly, to their ascended master state, usually will pick two elements to master or something, and it's rare for someone to master all four or five. So uh, well, that's weird. Well, everyone has their faves. Oh well, yeah, like <laughs> I'm very partial to fire and water, to be honest. Yeah, light. So those are, those are some of the huge elements for me. And I was told that um, I'm still working on the fire element because it's the hardest one 
to master. And when I told you that, what did you say about the plasma stuff? I thought that was interesting. Well, plasma is very tricky because you're dealing with something that is light and liquid and, you know, kind of matter at the same time. So it, it can be very tricky to, to deal with that. And once you get fire down, then you can move to lightning. Ooh, then we're to, we're gonna get to Thor in a minute. <laughs> he wishes he had that much control. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is gonna be fun. Wait till you hear people people about all these characters that are real. Okay, so um, tell me any memories about Brige that you have. Well, I'm. First of all, I want people to know that eight years ago when I ran into some people that I ended up adopting as my family, when they physically met me, they were like, oh my gosh, you're Bridge. I'm like, who the heck is Bridge? <laughs> They're like, it's this one goddess and everything. And the mention they mentioned goddess, I was like, record scratch, no thank you. <laughs> I have a very odd outlook on deities and I don't like being, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, yeah, no, don't do that, please. <laughs> like, I don't like being bad to you. I don't like being praised. Exactly. I don't like put on a pedestal of divinity of any, any sort. Yes, I have been deities in my last life, but even then I'm not like bow to me or I'm going to turn you into a chicken. <laughs> right. You know, in between our lifetimes of, uh, uh, garbage collecting and <laughs> seriously, <laughs> Or lifetimes of digging potatoes, right? Right. <laughs> okay. Like so, so, so far, I, I I only remember being two deities, which is Apollo and a Bridged. So, I'm pretty sure after that, I was like, no, thank you. <laughs> well, that's also in this realm, right? Yes. So um, now, Dogda was Bridges Bridges father, and right. And you were saying his wife was. So I don't know. These, these are Celtic gods as far yeah. as I, as far as I know, I don't know much about them. Um, I don't study religion or mythology all that much. I like mythology, but more of my mythology is like just kind of random things. Uh, the memories that I had, you know, cause like, some events are transpiring and I got told to, to look through some of the, the Celtic stuff. You know, they're like, you really are British. You need to go look at this. And I'm like, whatever you guys like, you know, say stuff that I am. You, when we first met months ago, you said that uh, you asked me if the, how the hell do you pronounce it? The Twatha, Twatha, de Danon. Twatha yeah. Danon meant anything. And then when I started doing a little bit of the research, my memories started to come back to me. You know, I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? And the memories that I have, again, may or, you know, may not coincide with other things. I don't know, because I don't know much about Celtic mythology, but I remember Dagda being a giant. Your father being right. a giant, okay. He was a giant. He kind of had a little bit tanner skin and he had like kind of a reddish brown hair to him. He always kind of kept it very long. I do remember his cauldron. I do remember his beat stick. <laughs> it, it's a staff. It's a staff. He... Oh, okay. <laughs> he had a little bit of a temper on him. <laughs> well, sometimes, sometimes not. He was, he was decently chilled, but you know, and so I, I remember him, but like my mother being Bridged, I remember her being Elven. I remember her having the red hair and I mean, really red hair. And I remember her having green eyes. There you and go. As far, as far as I know, um, I remember her being Donna. Share with people a little bit how they look at relationships. You know, like the sex and the relationship. Well, I mean, back in that day, like the, there was more than just humans back then. You had your fae, uh, ETs were still kind of walking around, 
you know, there was so many different species still happening that there was like a plethora of things going on. Relationships back then were still, depending on your cultures, a lot of Fey cultures and a lot of other cultures, even some ETs, they have open relationships because, well, let's just face it, I, am I allowed to say sex on here? <laughs> yes yes all right so sex is just sex it's it's something that you know your partner might not be into but you might be into or you find you you find an energetic fancy with somebody and you hook up for whatever and that's that there it's a huge difference from being in love with somebody so like when you marry especially like on this planet even back in the day most of it was for uh not convenience but like survival yeah i wouldn't really even say so much survival but treaties you know keeping the peace um yeah like some of it was convenience for i guess lower class but when you're dealing with gods or deities or royalty they don't get a break from that half the time when you're a deity it's like being royalty and you marry somebody for the sake of merging two families together to have peace and harmony because even ets and deities have wars obviously that's throughout history but you know so but you have your love interests off to the side and some people had multiple wives or multiple husbands mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that that's interesting